Yeah, I see the post on there. All right. So what I'm going to do. Share my screen. Cool. Let me see. Yeah, I have to give a talk right now, so I'll be busy. I just for a whole hour. Yeah. Yes. Quiet. Okay. <laughs> this is funny. All right. So uh, thank you. All right. So we ready? I'm ready. All right. Not. We are ready. So good yes. lunchtime. <laughs> Every, everybody for tuning in. We're officially live on this wonderful, beautiful Monday. My name is Virgil Moorhead Jr. I'm part of the Big Lagoon Rancheria, which is Yurok and Talawa. I'm also the Behavioral Health Director here at Two Feathers Native American Family Services. Two Feathers is located in McKinleyville in Humboldt County, about five and a half hours north of San Francisco. And this is our speaker series. Uh, we've been doing this speaker series about three months now. We have a wonderful guest today, as well as a wonderful colleague of mine. Uh, I was going to turn it over to Shoshone to introduce herself, and then I will introduce our guest today. Hi, Ayukui. Uh, I'm Shoshone Hostler. I'm a mental health therapist here at um, Two Feathers Native American Family Services. Uh, I work under the Checks Hope for Tomorrow program, and I'm just one of six therapists here that provide um, individual therapy for children ages 10 to 18 years old. And we're here with uh, Angela Valenzuela, so I'll throw it back over to Virgil to give her her formal introduction. Thank you. So, uh, you know, Dr. Valenzuela is a very esteemed educator. Uh, many roles she's played over the in her career. Specifically, she's a professor of educational policy and planning in the Department of Educational Administration at the University of Texas at Austin. She's a nationally recognized researcher, scholar, community advocate, policy act activist, and last but not least, a blogger. Uh, her books, uh, Subtractive Schooling, one of her books, U.S. Mexican Youth and Politics of Caring is a winner of num uh, multiple national awards, including the American Education Research Award. So welcome, Dr. Valenzuela. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's so nice to be here and to, to share a little bit of our work all the way from Austin, Texas. Um, yes. I'm very honored. Yeah, I'm very honored. And so I think the best way to go forward right now is just to provide you some um, background in terms of the work that we do in our community that, um, that is uh, organized by a volunteer, mostly volunteer group. Uh, we call our, ourselves Nuestro Grupo, which means our group in Spanish. Um, we joke that we were busy working so much and so hard that we, we just uh, always called ourselves Nuestro Grupo, Nuestro Grupo. And so that's what became our name. Uh, Mr. Grupo, but we're a community-based organization and um, we're part of a larger uh, movement or maybe even movements, um, better said. Uh, one is ethnic studies uh, that as we all know has really just gotten off the ground and it's big in California at this very moment in the Cal State University system, we understand and we hope that it becomes a, a requirement for graduation. Uh, we need to have that here in Texas um, and we need it everywhere. 
Um, and we're also part of the Grow Your Own Educator Movement. I direct at the national level, the National Latino Education Research and Policy Project. And uh, we're 10 member institutions and growing. And uh, the idea is in every site where we're located to, to be um, uh, like in the ground, to be grounded in our communities, community-based, social justice oriented, uh, uh, indigenous, uh, to be also you know, very much in partnership with our, our universities, our colleges, and also our school districts and schools. And in our case as well, um, our uh, city, the city of Austin. We, we uh, house Academia Cuauhtli, it's housed at, at the Emma S. Barrientos Mexican American Culture Center in Austin, Texas. In 2013, uh, September 20th, 2013, we met uh, archivists, children's book advocates, scholars, historians, bilingual education teachers, and it was to address issues of literacy in our community in East Austin, East Austin, it's part of a, a historically segregated community, and now it's part of a, of a community that's undergoing massive gentrification, a lot of displacement for our community. And, uh, and so we knew that, you know, have known that there was a crisis, um, but this, this became a crystallizing moment where we said, okay, well, what can we do? How can we address the literacy issues? And so our bilingual teachers, our dual language bilingual teachers were the most soulful voices I'm thinking of uh, uh, Patricia Nunez, who said, we don't have books, we don't have curriculum. There's so much turnover that, um, you know, once, once a person leaves, all of that disappears, it goes away. And we don't really have this kind of capacity and we're supposed to be a dual language district. Um, and, and so we, we heard her, her plea uh, we got involved uh, there. Uh, we created our group uh, very informally at first, um, very organic, and decided that, okay, well, of all of, of you who are here who want to keep on meeting, sign this sheet and we'll give you a call and, uh, and we'll find a time to meet. We met in homes, um, in restaurants. We met in a lot of places um, and uh, have been meeting ever since, uh, every week, once a week, um, to, on the one hand, um, you know, organize the activities of the school that, that came to be named Academia Cuauhtli, that's Nahuatl for Eagle, um, but also to be involved uh, politically in the community. And so we're the group that spearheaded ethnic studies in our school district. And so now it's taught in almost every high school in the Austin Independent School District. Uh, we spearheaded uh, ethnic studies uh, along with many, many others throughout the state of Texas that are part of the National Association for Chicana Chicano Studies. We spearheaded uh, ethnic studies, meaning Mexican American, Native American, Asian American, and African American studies at the state board of level so that we can have a change to official knowledge, right? Official curriculum, as Michael Apple tells it. Um, because we know that curriculum is the reproduction of how you think of who you are, of your consciousness, or more often than not, it's what you're not because no one is, is telling your his, you your history, teaching it, your culture, much less your language or your dialect, your identities, right? And so there's, we, there's these multi-layered pieces that we thought, well, we can, we can coalesce them in this space that, that then after a year became the Mexican American Culture Center and has been ever since. Um, I mean, not right now under COVID, but you know, it, it's still our, our kind of our, our, our home place. And um, we um, uh, serve children from five schools, Sanchez, Met, Zavala, Houston, and Perez Elementary, they're fourth graders. And um, uh, when we first got started, we were really concerned about whether the children were gonna like us, <laughs> whether they're gonna wanna come and be with us, you know, were we gonna be like that interesting, fun, good? And, um, and, I, and I won't, I'd be lying if I, you know, if I didn't say that, it, I mean, it's a real process and it takes time and it's a, a lot of trust building, particularly with the community, Title I schools, uh, that's gentrifying, a lot of displacement, crises every day. Um, and then on top of that, um, you know, in comes the Trump administration and the real vitriol against you know these these specific families and the, the deportations. Um, you know the whole DACA, the whole DACA 
uh, cloud has been weighing now over our families and our teachers, a number of them who are uh, our, our children's teachers. The teachers are bilingual, dual language certified. Uh, they teach in the Austin Independent School District. It's a that the schools are Title I schools, which means that they're a, a schools that are uh, overwhelmingly populated by low-income parents and families, for which the school district gets resources, Title I resources. They get also Title III for English language learners, and then the, and then with their own district uh, monies, we 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 have a a budget. Um, I mean, we do some independent uh, fundraising to make ends meet. But um, I mean, this is a good use of our dollars. This is like, you know, we often think that that this is like a gift, right? And it is a gift, but it's also, we, we pay for this. These are our dollars that are put to good use. And I think if we had a deeper sense generally as communities that, that what we're getting from the government is actually our investment back. And so we're very, you know, very, very, you know, like happy and proud to be getting, to be getting these resources because we can prepare teachers the teachers then take what they learn to their school, to their classrooms. Uh, it takes like two years. Half of what, what that involves is like, yes, learning the curriculum, but two, you know, liberating this knowledge, freeing this knowledge. They don't even know that they can teach about immigration or segregation, um, indigeneity. And, and they, they actually need to feel and be mentored in the actual teaching of it because our knowledges are so oppressed, right? Our ways of knowing our knowledges. So, um, uh, so, the, so I mentioned some kind of like hesitancy. What we knew going into all of this was that in order for us to uh, experience, have children experience a sense of rebirth, that we ourselves have to experience a, a sense of rebirth. We have to be uh, renewed ourselves. We, we don't call ourselves a bilingual education program. We call ourselves a, a uh, revitalization, a cultural revitalization project, because that's really at the heart of who you know, we see ourselves and what we want to accomplish in our instruction. Uh, the children come with their parents. The parents also get a curriculum. Um, we've, we're entering now our seventh year in, in, um, in this partnership and we've we become a, a training place and space for uh, for dual language teachers, and we also do independent teacher preparation. And so we've impacted uh, uh, at least 200 teachers district wide by now, and I'm sure the number is much higher uh, because of the many ways in which we mentor and and really in which by giving them control um, over uh, their own sense of what the best teaching is in this kind of environment, they've become owners of that agenda. And that's what we wanted from the very beginning, not for us to do something for on behalf of them, but, for, but, but to just create and incubate a space that then they would assume ownership over, which is exactly what has happened, thankfully. And our, and our children have won awards. Um, we've got you know, uh, national uh, 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 recognition. Uh, from Excelencia through a nomination. We didn't quite get, you know, Excelencia, um, an actual um, um, award, but we did get national recognition uh, for the work that, that we do. And we've, it's also our research site. I know we're, you know, many of us are scholars, we're graduate students, we're undergraduates. And so uh, it, it's our, also our research site. We're very um, inspired by the eagle. The eagle, it molts. Right, that means it loses about a third of its plumage when it, when it, when it gets heavy with oil. Uh, it's it's heavy, and that's the aging process for eagles. Um, and they go into a place where they can, um, where they can uh, undergo this transformation. And if they if they don't die, then um, they become new birds again. They look they look young all over again. And so they're a universal symbol of. Of, uh, of birth and I mean, rebirth, uh, resurrection, um, that, that, that for us just speaks to our heart and our, our hearts. And our, uh, our theme song is Aguila, Eagle, and uh, the students sing it and, uh, and, and you know, we love it and cherish it. And we have many songs that we sing and they, and they sing it in the context of the classroom, but also especially in the context of the Danza Mexica. Uh, we were um, named Academia Cuautli, in effect, by uh, Rosa Dupina, Yatonel Cuautli. She's, um, 
She's a maestra, a teacher of danza, of the danza mexica, the Aztec dance. And, uh, and she saw that what we saw was the eagle's vision. The, eagles, the eagle has the bird's eye view. The eagle sees everything, but also just has that laser-like capacity, right? It's, it's analytical to, to get its prey with precision that's you know, just exceptional from the highest peaks to the, you know, to the earth's waters and land. It has just this extraordinary capacity. The eagle also has the 360 degree vision and, and, and that's the circle, right? That's the circle, which is so important to uh, indigeneity. And then we have a piece on that, if you wanna share it, Virgil, with, with your audience of the, uh, the importance of the circle, which of course you, um, you know, you're well aware, uh, but others are not. And it, it speaks to us uh, because it helps us uh, to provide a sense of, um, of um, protection in these moments of, um, of, of uh, despair for so many of our families and communities. So we've done not just teaching and not just political advocacy, but we've brought attorneys to speak with our families to address immigration issues. We've, um, you know, we've, we've had moments like that. We do, we prepare them politically. They have mock demonstrations on behalf of workers' rights, on behalf of immigrants' rights, on behalf of bilingual education. Uh, they, they, there's that performance that, that becomes a, a community celebration of, of what, what we want uh, in terms of instilling in them a deep sense of, of not only social identity, but belonging. And one more thing, and then we can open up to Q&A, and that has to do with um, uh, our curriculum. Again, curriculum is the reproduction of consciousness, so we have to address what children are taught in schools. What we teach um, and what we write, it's, um, you know, it's age appropriate, it's, um, uh, it's a uh, TEKS aligned, it's aligned to our state object, uh, learning objectives, and it's available uh, district-wide to all teachers in grades three, four, five, six, seven, and 11. That's when you begin to have systemic change, when you're able to have that uh, through a partnership, it's a formal legal partnership, you know, to have those understandings that then become uh, curricula that are just regularly available to teachers should they, you know, want to do that, and of course, we're promoting that that they be culturally relevant. Um, and so, um, but but the school is very special. Uh, we have great teachers, um, and um, uh, one of our units is on identity. We do spend a lot of time. It's the first one. We spend a lot of time on identity, and the children. Uh, Alejandro Kiawi Martinez does such a beautiful job of teaching uh, using this maps unit, um, teaching the children that. Uh, that they didn't cross the border, that the border crossed them, right? And that their ancestors are from this continent and that, um, that they should not ever feel that they're not home, even if you have these you know, powerful you know, uh, governmental organizations and agencies telling them that they're, that they're foreign and that they don't belong here. And, and I, ha you know, I have to tell you that, that that one piece of instruction that one piece of instruction, um, I think, is probably uh, the most enduring because it, it's something that liberates the children, and they realize that um, that they belong. They're part of the American narrative. They're part of of history, right? They're not these displaced peasants that have very little value in society as they're often viewed. And so, just you know, to know that we're be able to uh, also redeem right that 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 troubled sense of self that's dispossessed that's dislocated and it's enduring ongoing dispossession is probably one of the greatest things that i think that we accomplish thank you for that well said and very uh, informative and so what's coming up for me is bringing it into today's times uh and specifically today you know uh if you looked at the news the the Washington Redskins uh, ownership and due to the pressure of many different people and organizations have agreed to change their name. And I know a uh, part of your work and you've described it is about sort of changing these structured silences and yeah. distortion on how our communities are represented and misrepresented. And so I'm wondering if, if you can unpack a little bit more of like how do we get people, whether it's an auntie or uncle or teacher, 
engaged, inspired to help with movement building. Because as I see it, it took many years to get that name changed. And so when I, I see your work as not only a professor, but so much around movement building and community organizing. So I'm just wondering if you can unpack a little bit what you found to, to get people inspired, motivated, and come together to make change. Yeah, uh, thank you for that question. Um, and so we are very much um, in our own epistemology, our own way of knowing uh, relational. And we're, uh, we understand relationality um, to mean uh, th that granular, you know, one on work caring, beginning with ourselves, caring, caring for each other. And I think that's what everybody really appreciates it so that when we meet, it, it, um, it, it's healing when we meet. We began every meeting uh, with, um, with something that someone says that's personal, uh, inspiring. It could be a poem or song, um, a reflection, a letter they wrote to their parent or that a parent wrote to them. Um, it's a deep soulful reflection. And, and uh, we, that, that, that practice, um, it has meant a lot to to us because we need to be nourished right um and it's called floricanto and these those are instructions from our mexica ancestors who said that if you want to live a good life you have to live a life filled with gratitude right you have to be grateful for what you have and for what you are you know for for who you are in your community and your family and so that's that has to be intentionally nourished as a spirit and uh, as an identity, as a, re, a, re, a reason for, for existing. This is not a, a technical exercise, right? I mean, there's technical aspects uh, always, but um, in, in terms of the, uh, the, the chemistry that's needed to, to get it and keep it going, it, it's these kind of spiritual uh, approaches that tap into feeling, that tap into memory, to song, um, that, that really, um, that really nourish. Um, so relationality is huge. I think the other is uh, being multi-generational. And so uh, we have elders, right? We have elders like Marta Cotera, who's the first published Chicana feminist, as it turns out. She was Gloria Ansaldúa's teacher when, when Gloria was here. Some of you know who Gloria is, Ansaldúa. Um, and so we have, we have her and, um, um, other elders, Bambi Cardenas. Um, it's a pretty extraordinary group. She was a former uh, former president of a university in South Texas. Uh, now she's retired here in Austin. And then we have our uh, our graduate students, and we have our faculty, right? And and so what the graduate students like is not only the work, but the fact that they have very quick and ready access to us as faculty. And so. Um, you know, for me as a professor, it, it, it mostly means that I can take care of most of my advising pretty quickly, <laughs> very efficiently, because I'm in regular contact. And it's efficient for them, too, because not only am I in regular contact with them, but uh, the students are in contact with each other and able to be resources to each other. Um, and so I, 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 think the, I think all of that means that, that wisdom and knowledge and history uh, very deep is passed on and um, and it helps guide action and, um, and and since we do everything in a in a circle you know we're able to uh, you know always devise um, you know very thoughtful approaches to to what we want to accomplish next so uh, the more recently it was our covid our covid crisis for our families with many of them not being connected not having access and so we've been um, involved um, deeply with the city of Austin, and uh, we already have we already had one um, uh, giveaway of PPE uh, masks, uh, together with uh, supplies that we have that we had in, in stock that we're not going to make use of because we can't even get into our building right now. And we had a lot of stuff, you know, we had, you know, talking about you know pens, pencils, papers, crayons, clay. Um, uh, just all kinds of materials that we were able to, you know, put into a nice bag for every family so that the children would have 
um, you know, scissors and, and glue and, and, you know, construction paper to, you know, to work and draw on over the summer so that, um, and so that their, their, their minds and their creativity can keep, can keep happening. Um, we're also envisioning right now, and we're trying to get a grant or two so that we can do our identity unit online in a way that's engaging. And we're all learning this right now. Like, how do you do this, especially with these audiences? Another grant um, that's in process to provide digital um, learning opportunities for our parents uh, with one of our um, members, uh, Dr. Emma Mancha Sumners, uh, being more than willing to work one-on-one -on -one in Spanish. I and mean, we're talking about parents that did, didn't know what a space bar was. And, they're having, and they have to get on a Zoom conference call, right? what a space bar, what a tab is. They didn't know those things. So it was, it was very exhausting. And we're gonna have a new set of parents uh, this year with you know, the, the similar kinds of um, uh, um, you know, challenges. And so um, we wanna be again, as a partnership helpful to our teachers and helpful to the parents that we work with. And so I think when you engage you know, your relational, your spiritual, the danza is very spiritual. I mean, the danza is ceremony. You know, the danza mexica. When you have that ethos, when you're when you're directly addressing immediate needs that the community has, um, when you have a track record of doing that, and and then when you deliver, right? When you deliver, that's that that. I mean, you can get you you you've got trust. You know, you've got you've got a community that is dedicated uh, in the same ways that you are dedicated to uh, everyone's survival and, and ideally more, you know, more than just surviving, but um, well-being. It's hard. I'm not going to say it's easiest. It's, we're in a crisis. Thank you. And, and I think part of that uh, that you talk about uh, is decol decolonizing official knowledges, right? And I know your your book, uh, Subtractive Schooling, it's been about 20 years. And so I'm curious where, you know, that sort of ethnographic study and really, you know, deep understanding of the, the experiences of the students and families that you were working with to write that book, where are you seeing changes or improvements from 2000, you know, you know, from going to No Child Left Behind to now Betsy DeVos in this crisis. Uh, I'm just wondering for those teachers and administrators and schools, what you see are some of the pressing issues uh, in education right now and some of the changes as well as improvements since 2000 uh, when you wrote that book? Well, <clears throat> what I what I really uh, see is that what, what uh, took off, um, and, and it's, it's, it's a movement that cycled in and out, is the ethnic studies movement, right? And so um, uh, I, I was also one of the, one of three persons that uh, was the, uh, the official witness in the, in the trial in Tucson, where in, uh, was it 2000? Uh, gosh, time just passes so fast. No, it was like, what, 2012, 2000, I don't know, but it was 2010, 2012, when all the bad things were happening in Arizona, they dismantled the uh, Mexican American Studies Program at the, at the Tucson Independent School District. And so there was, you know, there was a community and teachers that uh, filed a suit. And so I was an expert witness uh, in that suit. And so um, uh, what I appreciated about being asked was that they, they, they saw me and my work as fundamental to what they were doing and and i i wondered what part of it they thought was fundamental and what i really liked um was uh that they said it was the caring part of it so so if you know uh these these people uh curtis acosta um you know uh, um uh sean sean arce um and, and it was other teachers as well they they um they, they came together and they asked themselves a question upon reading my book, uh, which is a real good question for all of us to be asking. It was the question we asked when we started Academia Cuauhtli is, is, you know, what does it mean to really authentically care for our kids, right? And, and, and really it's a question you just, you, you always, always have to ask. It, it can't, you can't ask it once and then it's settled. 
because circumstances change. Community, you know, or, I mean, we've had to be very agile, right? Um, in caring, in our caring, in our caring, taking us to directions we hadn't quite anticipated, right? Um, uh, but. I, I think that's very enduring. I'm very happy about that, uh, that, um, that authentic caring and how it's connected to um, our, our identities, including ide indigenous identities uh, has prevailed. I, and, I, and I think it's inspired. I think it's inspired a whole nation, if you will. Um, and, and, I, and I think we're, I, I think we're part also of something that's, you know, burgeoning within, you know, Latin America, the whole Abiyayala movement, the, the movement of, um, you know, people on the other side, uh, you know, south of us that uh, the intellectuals that, um, that are also saying that, you know, what we're, what we're living is the creation of these colonial symbolic administrations, these, these symbolic administrative orders that we don't have to accept. You know, we, we, we had a name before we were called South America. We had names for who we were. We were Abiyayala, the Kuna Indians, named the whole continent Abiyayala, right? And um, and but there were of course Turtle Island. There's many names, uh, but but the point is that there, there there were names before even America or the United States existed, right? And so so I, I think I think uh, what's changed for our community in 2020 is is uh, and I think for Mother Earth as well is a reclaiming. There is a reclaiming of what is ours, right? And I think that's so empowering, uh, and I think it's so beautiful, and I think it's also it's uh, awe-inspiring. Um, uh, I, I mean, I I think a really interesting conversation to have would be like, how how are y'all understanding the, you know, this coronavirus moment and situation? I mean, I, I see it as, as 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 Mother Earth reclaiming herself. I mean, we're a nuisance, right? We're, we're we're, we're egocentric, we're anthropomorphic. We, we, we think that we're the end all and be all of this planet when in reality, we amount to little more than a pesky nuisance that's destructive. And so, you know, I mean, I, I just think we think way too much of ourselves and we need to have epistemic humility. This is paradigm shifting, it's paradigm breaking. And, and uh, I know that, uh, uh, that what we're experiencing is the macrocosm of the microcosm of Arizona. And that rupture that happened there that, that brought in the, the, the terrible laws that, that was Trump before Trump, right? Arizona, they already knew what Trumpism was before he was even president, such that when we arrive at, at this, you know, like this bigger um, macro uh, aggression, aggressive government, we, um, I, I think many of us were able to intuit it as the, the natural, unfortunate reaction by a, a, a reactionary right that does not want to be decentered, no matter how healing and helpful it would be for them to be decentered. As far as, you know, I mean, I think everything is happening right now. You know, the, the, the changing of the, of, the, of the, I mean, it's amazing. This has been an issue forever, right? The changing of the, of the football team's name. How long has this been an issue? It's always been an issue, but now it's like just, uh, you know, it's it's the um, it's that storm, that perfect storm that's come into play in part because of COVID, because of Trump, and 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 I think we need to take some credit here. Okay, I mean, people don't don't say this too much, but I mean, we've been teaching these things for a long time uh, as parents, as educators. We we we've been reading. We know our history. We've been reading it. it it's meaningful to us. It's not you know a, a symbolic observance just because. It's something that that has life and meaning for us, and so uh, I have two millennial children, and and uh, they're listening, and so I, I think there's also sort of this cumulative impact of ethnic studies, mostly at the university levels, that has um, that is also finding expression, beautiful expression, today in uh, in the voices, the poetry, the song, the spoken word. The, just the real soulful, and you know that response. It, it is about love. It is, it is enormously about love. So anyone that would cast it as as um, as as negative, right, as uh, anti-social, is um, is is really not listening. And and that has been the problem. You shouldn't have to have a so social movement to have 
the Redskins team name changed. You shouldn't have to have a, a, a movement to get rid of these statues that really belong in museums, right? Um, and so, uh, I, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, our, our identities, our cultures, our languages, our dialects, they've been in jail, right? And, and if, they're, if they're in jail, then that is the beginning of the school to prison pipeline is the way in which our consciousness is being distorted, right? And, and not only by what is said, but mostly by, by what is not said and that vacuum that is left wide open into which uh, anything can fill it. Thank you. Uh, I know, you know, I've been asking a couple questions, so I want to throw it over to Shoshone, uh, get her involved in this lovely uh, dialogue. Yeah, all of the um, topics you're speaking on are so inspiring, and I really connect with the identity development um, parts. And tying in some of the identity development and some of the subtractive schooling concepts and, and just taking into account like growing your own um, professionals, teachers, administrators, counselors. Um, I'm just curious in your own life, um, who has motivated you throughout your educational experience and some of the lessons or some of um, what, what, how has that impacted your life personally? Wow, <laughs> I've had so many influences. Um, uh, but I would say that, that, you know, that my grandfather was a major uh, influence. I think a lot of this stuff is ancestral, right? It's in the DNA. Um, my father was, my grandfather was a, a, a minister, a Protestant minister. I come from a long line of ministers, by the way. And um, not, not many people know that. Uh, we're founders of the Baptist Church in Mexico, in my family. We're in the history of the Baptist Church in Mexico. We're from the mountains of Guerrero, from uh, Southern Mexico. And uh, my family, um, as Protestants in a Catholic dominant society, I think they were Jews, by the way, I think they were running away from the Inquisition. And so, because there's no memory of Catholicism in my family, going back many generations, there's absolutely no memory. And so, um, um, and so, but, and what distinguishes my, my family um, in that realm of like life is, uh, is social justice. And so, um, and so as we were growing up, we, we always, uh, always worked with the immigrant community, you know, and the destitute, always. Uh, we never did not. That was always our charge, our mission. To, to work with the poor and you know, to work with our, the, our immigrant community that, that al always faced difficulties proverbially, proverbially, right? But then as I grew older, and I mean, that was very foundational to me. Um, my grandfather, um, he integrated the river in, in, in West Texas of all things. Uh, there's a story about that. Uh, our, our river was segregated, uh, whites upstream, Mexicans in the middle, and then blacks downstream. And there weren't even many blacks. Uh, my parents were involved in um, in the bringing down of the signs, no Mexicans or dogs allowed. For us in West Texas, Jim Crow was against Mexicans, right? It was, um, it was, and there were a few African-Americans and of course it was against them too. But for, as a whole, it was against Mexicans. It was de facto, de facto um, discrimination. And, um, and so there were, there was, there was a lot of, um, um, a uh, real hurt associated with that whole moment. It was very hurtful uh, to my parents. Um, there's a lot of resentment about that. Um, and uh, and so, you know, I, I think I just always carried that sense of it because I saw it through my parents and in my grandparents and I heard all the stories, right? Um, and I feel very proud that my grandfather was, uh, and my grandmother as well um, were very involved in um, bringing down that racial order that was so segregated and punishing. Um, and so, but then as I moved, you know, and, and grew and uh, grew older um, and I, I um, went to college and I um, wanted to be an English major and it turned out they had um, African-American literature and Jewish American literature and, uh, that was taught in the program that I went to in my hometown college 
of Angelo State University. What uh, I, I learned through African American studies and, Ju and Jewish American literature was um, about the oppression of uh, minorities, of people that are minoritized, right? And um, uh, and I, I grew interested in learning more about that and how it mapped onto what I observed in our own uh, hometown and, and how I myself had issues with my own voice. I didn't know who I was or where I came from. And I wanted, I hungered for that knowledge. And so I feel that almost every decision I've ever made has been a response to that hunger for that self-knowledge that the systems separated me from that I only came to know later as intentional, right? And so today, um, Martha Cotera inspires me, the person that I mentioned earlier. Uh, she's, um, um, I don't think she'll mind me saying this, but she's uh, 80, in her early 80s. Um, and, um, and so, uh, and I can't keep up with her. She wears me out just watching her. Uh, and so she's one of those super agers, right? That I wanna be a super ager. Um, and I just love seeing how every day is, um, is about social justice. My dad is, is, is almost the same age. I think they're only a few months apart. And my dad is also, uh, who is a minister in Peru. Um, he, um, he wakes up every day just with you know, a million tasks and, and he gets them done, right? And I'm just thinking, wow, and he can, you know, he can walk the valley. He can still do all of these things. It's, he's got great health, he's in great health. And so I talked to my dad uh, not too long ago, and I said, uh, I said hey, dad, I, I'm really amazed that at your age, you're just, you know, keeping as busy as ever. I said, what, what, uh, what explains that? And uh, he said, well, I just, I guess I just never lost the spark. That's what he said. And so then, like, a half hour later, I talked to Martha, and I said, hey, Martha, I just talked to my dad. And um, I asked him about how, he's, how it is that he's so active at his age. And he said that it was his spark, that he'd never lost the spark. I said, what about you? And she said, every day there's injustice, right? And so I think that combines, those two, you know, those two responses combined is that, is that, you know, for those of us that have a conscious, a conscience and a consciousness and the capacity and the privilege and the honor, I would always say is the honor, the real honor. Uh, I, I just don't know how it could not be about that. Although I know it is different for so many other people in their lives, but what we try to inspire is that you know social justice isn't episodic; it's a way of life. You know, policy isn't you know passing a bill uh, or killing a bill. Uh, policy is a way of life. It's being engaged on a daily basis with our communities, being grounded so that we can we can you know provide the good medicine, provide the good knowledge, um, the, the the knowledge that is going to you know help us to um, uh, to live, to have a better life, right? And to have a better, better life for our children. Thank you for that answer. And as a follow-up, um, I'm curious, up in Hoopa, on the reservation up here, um, there's a trauma-informed movement. And I'm wondering how to kind of, how does the um, uh, decolonized theory um, interact with trauma-informed care because uh, trauma-informed care doesn't necessarily touch all the bases that um, decolonized uh, theory oh. does. And so I'm, I'm wondering if you can um, speak to any special considerations or um, in maybe trying to combine the two with the system we already have um, working um, in, on our reservation, if uh -huh. you could speak to that a little bit. Yeah, it's interesting that you asked that. I was just thinking about it today. Um, I was thinking about this uh, area of scholarship within um, immigration. In my, in my grandfather's case, uh, who came from Mexico, um, he was actually exiled um, back in 1934. Um, and he had to suddenly come across the border. And uh, so began our family on the side of the border in a, in, under very difficult circumstances with a lot of trauma associated with that, that was enduring, that I'm still trying to um, unpack and understand. And, um, and so um, uh, an idea that's very important in that 
uh, that's very situated, right? It's situated in an experience, which is part of the answer to your question. But um, uh, it, it um, he experienced, I, I can call it now cultural mourning. He, it, it's really the loss of a world, right? So it's like all of a sudden, uh, everything that's familiar to you is no longer the same, right? Um, and it's, uh, and so it's not, it's not equal to not feeling comfortable in your skin because of acculturative reasons that psychologists might call acculturative stress. But I think it's even deeper than that, that, that has to do with the dislocation experience that's, that's so traumatic that it manifests as uh, sadness, as depression, emotional distance, um, the kinds of things that um, that that uh, you know, like they affect how you raise your children, and they affect how you minister. They affect uh, your relationship with everyone that remains invisible. Um, I mean, you should have gotten treatment for all of that, but which uh, every know everyone in the room knows is present, and in, you know you can't you can't dispel it because. It's the weight of that experience um, that that um, is is un under addressed, or in, in his case, never addressed. And so I, I think that as far as you know, trauma informed practices are, um, I, if they're not really deeply, uh, I think, situated in um, a knowledge, a deep knowledge of the historical experiences, if they're not felt in the flesh, right, then I think that there's the possibility of it being more of a, like a mechanical kind of, um, of approach to healing, right? And sometimes that's all you have. You have a formula, you have techniques, um, you have you know, an approach, uh, but, you, but, you, but you don't always have in that process, but which I think you really should have is, is a real situatedness. And it's not only about around, um, you know, the kinds of things I'm talking about related to uh, uh, dislocation and trauma, but, but also the, an intersectional approach related to, 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 you know, whether you're a woman or, you know, transgendered, or, you know, you're feeling these things in the same process that, that, that create uh, an even deeper sense of, of, um, uh, of, of dislocation. Um, I mean, there's, there's, um, you know, we're, we're all uh, our own worlds inside of ourselves. And so I, I think that um, if, if we can't excavate those worlds in our practice, we may not be the right people doing this. We might should find someone else that can be a vehicle for this healing if we ourselves are, are not fully like connecting we're not you know fully like i mean i think that these these uh you know relationships are um ideally uh not not just between like a practitioner and 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 someone in need of help or support but they're deeper than that they're meaningful and they and they and they and they manifest you know, you know, however they manifest as as um, authentic and and meaningful and genuine and then we've all had this experience of being able to connect you know, better and more to some than others. And uh, what, what exists in that, in that center uh, that isn't always like fulfilled is that, um, that knowledge of the other that, that should be uh, always informing, right? Always informing our, our practice and our relations. I had a follow up to that. When you say the situational knowledge or taking the, you know, the, maybe let's say local, uh, what is the arts? And I know you've talked about, you know, dance and song in the beginning, like, what is the arts coming to the play? Uh, you know, I know you talked about uh, in the schools in, in, in Texas of, you know, teaching tradition and, and starting meetings with music and our, our stories. And so I'm just wondering, when you say situational, does 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 is that where arts and stories come into play? Yeah, yeah, most certainly. Um, 
Yeah. So situatedness is just this, you know, academic term that um, that you're that that no one person or no one situation is alike. We're all different, and uh, so you can't treat others like you know they're replaceable for anybody else, right? Uh, that no one is actually replaceable for anyone. You know, one can't substitute for another. You um, you have to uh, get to know the person, right? They have to. Uh, if you're relational, truly relational, they get to know you as well, right? Um, I mean, it's a complete circle of caring, right? Um, the arts are, are, you know, singing, theater, dance, um, you know, uh, the material arts, all, all of these, uh, uh, these manifestations of being are, um, are vehicles for awareness, right? For uh, self-understanding. Uh, sometimes we're, as we're adopting a new identity, I mentioned that um, uh, we teach indigeneity, but but not as like a subject, but one that uh, we want the students and ourselves to internalize, that we are of this land. We didn't come from Europe, right? We didn't come from Africa. We didn't come from Asia. Well, where do we come from? Well, we came from here, right? And it's it, when we're so colonized, as Mexican Americans, um, and I'm not counting indigenous peoples <laughs> who are Mexican, but mestizos and um, you know others that have no connection to their indigeneity, to thinking that um, that that Mexican identity, which is really a nation state identity that comes into existence with the emergence of nation states, right, is um, is a colonial identity. It's a colonial framework, right? It remains a colonial identity and framework today. And it's policed and it's a punishing, um, you know, a, a punishing moment that we've been in an extended period of time um, with the policing of our borders. And so, um, I don't know, am I answering your question? Just how we, through arts, we uh, are able to extend meaning, extend, uh, I think I think becoming someone, like becoming indigenous, it doesn't happen overnight and it may not happen in a lifetime, it's a journey, right? And so you journey by dealing with different pieces of that. And it's not just being indigenous, it's being a young woman, a young female, it's being transgendered and understanding issues of fairness and equity and being able to represent that in art. We have a, a butterfly unit where the butterflies represent the migrant children, right? And so, so the, the butterflies come from Michoacan. And so they learn about the, the passage of the butterflies from Michoacan, this big, beautiful cave you know, that's supposed to be epic, legendary. And they fly all the way over here and they don't have borders, right? Well, you know, aren't we like the butterflies? Aren't we also, uh, many of them are from Michoacan. Aren't we also from, you know, from these, these sacred places? And, and so why should we have borders that that um that separate us right why should we and how and how do those borders um connect to other borders that we have that uh, are problematic right uh, against african americans against immigrants right uh, borders against um sometimes even just doing the right thing right like why is it wrong why is it wrong to to know your ident indigenous identity. Why is it wrong to teach it, right? There's nothing wrong with it, right? And so through the arts, um, I think it helps us to, to sort of even transcend the moment and uh, imagine new possibilities for ourselves that aren't like, like abstract or reckless or artificial, but actually you know, very much um, anchored in our own Historic history and our historical knowledge, our, our sense of it. I guess, yeah, I guess where I was sort of going with that is, you know, I, I spent some time at Stanford, uh, like yourself, uh, and, you know, did my postdoc there and some counseling uh, with the students. And, and I think so much of our educational system teaches us to intellectualize, teaches us about the abstract, the sort of more Western-based science. And it seems like a big part of, of your work. And, and I think it's, it, it is a different way of being, a different way of, of, of going about knowledge and, and living when you include the arts, when you include 
spirituality and, and really it ties to this present moment and how to deal with what's going on nationally because you know we can learn so much from our own cultural traditions as indigenous people and, and to me that's very much sort of this art space approach or this sort of non-intellectual approach to, 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 to living. So I, I think that's where my question was coming from. Well, but I, I think that, that uh, it, it is intellectual and I think it's, it's very uh, profoundly intellectual. I think we even have to decolonize what that means, right? And, um, and so when we're, when we're intellectual, we're, we're studying very deeply, right? And uh, we're, we're studying intersectionally we're studying historically, we're studying like, like in a situated way, you know, specifically with specifics. Um, and so, uh, and so we're able to, you know, think of decolonization in, in, in novel ways, so a, a concept that we use amongst ourselves. I already mentioned relationality, which is an important concept. Uh, but another is this idea of the third space and how creative, just being in a space that's not school, it's not university. So, you know, we're not necessarily iterative of the values of the ways of knowing and talking in those spaces, right? And, and when you're in the, not, you know, not that we don't want to be in those spaces, we have to be in those spaces and we want to reform those spaces, but those spaces are, are iterative of certain ways of talking, of knowing, of doing, of certain kinds of um, uh, relationships to people and organizations. So when you're situated in the third space, I mean, and you can cite Homi Baba, you can cite others, right? Uh, scholars that are uh, writing about, uh, in very deep ways about the third space, that, that's deep intellectual thought that we're, you know, like we're trying to understand. At first, when we got started, we were just trying to make the school run and happen. Uh, it's, it's on Saturdays, it's from nine to 12, and it's a, a lot of work to, to get kids from five schools into one space. And um, just the, 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 the mechanics of that are, uh, sometimes overwhelming, uh, but now now we've got it down. And we have a system. And we know how to do this, right? But um, but I mean, I think after the third year in particular, we we, we began to um, realize that uh, the kids like us, parents like us. Uh, this is cool. The you know the the district lights likes us. Um, uh, what is it about us that that you know what is that that makes it work? Uh, I mean, we like each other. We're and it's family. You know, we're family. Um, you know, we, we're um, um, you know looking out. We've got that eagle's vision, and uh, it's kind of cool when you have victories. You know, it's and and you're the reason for the victories, and they're major ones. That's pretty cool. Or you're part of, like at the state level, um, it's inspiring. Are you kidding? That's it's it's uh, it's it's very inspiring. But um, I mean, but I think that that. Um, <clears throat> You know, um, <clears throat> and, and I'm an higher ed, I teach at the university, and oftentimes, you know, everything I've just said, it, it, it gets reduced to service, right? And it's like, um, I, I just think that, you know, and, and service doesn't rank as highly as teaching and research. It just doesn't, it, and it should, right? And then it impacts, you know, your how you get evaluated for merit, it gets, it, it, it impacts uh, sometimes how people think of your work that, well, you're just out in the community, right? In, in, in a condescending way, which um, I think says more about um, how higher education is disconnected from, uh, um, I mean, not only um, community, but the intellectual concerns, epistemologies, and frameworks that either exist or are born out of that experience of being um, uh, embedded in in our communities. Why would we not want to be embedded in our communities? Why would I don't understand that really? Um, I, I know that that's the opposite of what is normally true. I, I know that. Uh, I think that I lament that. That's unfortunate. We're trying to we're trying to disrupt that. I think we are with some success disrupting that. Um, but but I, I think what is being reinscribed is patriarchy and white hegemony, white supremacist hegemony in the process that wants nothing more than to keep on with this agenda of separating us from our communities because then we don't we can't speak with power from that standpoint, right? So it's a denial of power that comes from that standpoint of speaking in solidarity with 
our communities that is being systemically denied in all of these ways, symbolic and real. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, I see we're about out of time. I'm uh, just wondering if uh, you have any uh, last words of wisdom and, and perhaps, you know, I know you reference uh, Walter uh, Mignolo and uh, the uh, colonial matrix of power. And so if there's any last recommendations or uh, insights about how we can uh, sidestep the colonial matrix of power in these times, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, so as I wrote that piece, and I encourage everybody to read it, um, um, it's, uh, you know, like trying to figure out how we can uh, fight the state board of education. I mean, and, uh, and that was a, a long, long struggle that our community was involved in. And I interviewed, I conducted you know, some data collection, I kept records, it was all in the context of the ethnic studies movement that included Arizona, but of course, California and um, Colorado, New Mexico, other states. Um, and, and looking at the intransigence of the school, the state board of education, and um, what um, you know, what came to light for me as I reflected, you know, it was like you you learn better when you look backwards than in the moment, right? But uh, but that there there is power when we as communities enunciate a new reality, and you know, it's a politics of refusal. Um, it's it's asserting a new identity right, in a public way, in a demanding way that, um, that, that can take us far. It's, it's intergenerational, it's multi-generational, it's our children, it's our teachers, people from all walks of life, it's our legislators, right? And they're motivated by the same things that we're motivated by, which is epistemic justice. You know, we have a right to our history and our knowledge, right? And, um, and, and so uh, when we, when we, um, you know, brought forward our proposals, we were always getting played by the State Board of Education. And so um, uh, those proposals have a deeper history that go back to the State Board of Education uh, deciding whether or not they wanted to integrate our histories, uh, you know, really specific items, uh, Cesar Chavez, Dolores Huerta, um, uh, the United Farm Workers, um, the 60s movement, just a lot of examples of um, the, 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 the search, the pursuit of being included, right? Uh, you know, women also, you know, the women's agenda, the Latina feminist agenda has been part of this. Um, and so there's a shorter struggle and then there's a longer struggle. This is a, a very long struggle. <laughs> if anyone uh, who's part of the multicultural education movement would know, it's been a very, very long struggle. But the more recent struggle, I think what we learned was, um, you, and, and you only learn this in the struggle. You only learn it. You're not gonna learn it as an armchair theorist. What we learned is that we can really maximize our potential here for our, for our knowledge if we don't keep fighting the Texas State Board of Education for inclusion in the history standards right, for inc inclusion in the social studies standard, which was the time honored way to do this. That was the expected way to always do this. But, you know, enter Arizona into the picture. And then what happens is that uh, it creates this idea for a different direction in policy. And it's multi-sided. It's, it's not just me, it's uh, Ruben Cortez, one of the state board members with his constituents. It's people in South Texas that uh, in the Mexican American studies program are um, uh, you know, like realizing the, the very same things. And so we organize. And, uh, and so when we called for ethnic studies, again, it's these four areas that uh, we called for and that we won, African American, Native American, Asian American, and um, Mexican American studies, we, uh, we disarmed the State Board of Education because they were, in, they were used to arguing all of these debates historically forever in a day in the context of the existing processes, procedures, the, uh, uh, you know, the ways of doing policy in the context of existing standards. And so uh, 
all of a sudden we come up with a brand new proposal um, that's outside of their framework and they couldn't process it. And then it, they just they couldn't assimilate that into their thinking, right? And so it, it disarmed them and uh, created that wedge, that space that we needed to then say, okay, well, this is what we want, right? And then we had to struggle uh, from that point forward on what we wanted. And what's really nice is that, you know, once you got, once you got a, an edge in, is that you're gonna be able to argue for more. And so we are uh, looking at y'all at California, we do want an ethics studies requirement. Uh, Texas isn't done with us. Uh, we've got much, much uh, exciting things, many, many exciting things ahead. Thank you, that, that was very helpful. And, and just tying it back to, you know, two feathers and kind of what we're trying to do is uh, at least with, the, with our mental health part of pro, our programming is to rethink what counseling is, what therapy is, because in many of our indigenous communities, talk therapy was it's a it's a it's a it's a cultural tradition not from ours it's from western you know europe and so but but when you mention that frame if you look if you go to policymakers in california or you go to the county they they can only look within at least i see it is they only look within that frame of talk therapy of our medication and so uh you know as you talked it, it reminded me of how you know, we can continue to try to be creative uh, in pushing back on what therapy or counseling is for indigenous communities. Because maybe that could be, you know, a garden. Maybe that could be spiritual, you know, the, uh, interventions, many different things. But it's about, you know, getting those individuals and policymakers to think outside of their current frame. Is that kind of uh, what you were saying? Yeah, like, you know, we got to decolonize everything, right? Like, wh why couldn't we have begun with a song? Like be this whole webinar, why couldn't we have started with a song, right? Why can't we start, you know, like like classes with poetry, with an invocation, a performance? But why can't we have that, right? Why, why can't we nurture the spiritual arts, right? Uh, because being is just so, there's so much that, that, um, that so much richness and wealth and who we are and where we come from that we have to offer the world, the planet. That's the wonderful news here, right? Is that we actually have a lot. We have the good medicine. We have it, the good medicine that is for this moment of all, of all times, of all things. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank everybody for tuning in, making comments and likes. Uh, this was, a, at least for me, a fabulous time. We'll be back at it tomorrow and uh, Thursday. Uh, so look out for some flyers uh, and have a good rest of your uh, Monday and your rest of your week if you don't tune in tomorrow. See you later. <laughs>